So this past year, I took in a couple of classics that I really should have done a long time ago. And those classics were... Gaston LaRue's Phantom of the Opera and John Carpenter's Halloween. I also saw Halloween 2 in that same year, though I personally found it to be somewhat less of a classic than OG Halloween. Possibly in part because I've worked a lot of holidays in medical facilities, and I cannot picture any hospital anywhere as vacant as this one is on the scariest night of the year. And in other part due to scenes like this. The good news is that if this movie embarrassed you, Mr. Pleasance, you are off the hook for any other movies in this silly franchise. Because even if Dr. Loomis had not died at the end of this one, he might realistically still be in jail for all the child endangering and assaults with deadly weapons he did. Oh wait, here he is three movies later. Weird. Anyway, I am told by my fellow horror enthusiasts that longtime fans of the Halloween movies often find themselves in disagreement on what part of the story are canon versus what parts of the story are stupid claptrap. And, uh, spoilers. One of those disagreements concerns whether or not Laurie Stroud is Michael's sister, as outright stated in Halloween 2. Jesus, don't you see what he's doing here in Haddonfield? He killed one sister 15 years ago, now he's trying to kill the other. While I do not consider myself enough of an expert on John Carpenter's Halloween to veto anyone else's interpretations, I can tell you why I think it is a stronger narrative when Michael and Laurie are not siblings. And that is because I believe that first great Halloween movie makes the most sense as a retelling of Phantom of the Opera. Right, I know what you're thinking. Not all fiction-born maniacs in masks are the same, madam. How is the audacious claim that this is equivalent to this any more than a stupid internet edgelordism? Hear me out, though. If by chance you are either familiar with the Phantom of the Book or Lon Chaney's Phantom, you know already that not all incarnations of said Phantom are poor souls or underappreciated geniuses. In fact, the Phantoms a la Gaston LaRue and Lon Chaney play homicidal games with Christine that would not be noticeably out of place in a Saw movie. In one of the caskets, you will find a scorpion. In the other, a grasshopper. Aren't they pretty? If you turn the grasshopper, we shall all be blown up. If you turn the scorpion, all that gunpowder will be soaked and drowned. Mademoiselle, to celebrate our wedding, you shall make a very handsome present to a few hundred Parisians. You shall make them a present of their lives. For with your own fair hands, you shall turn the scorpion. And merrily, merrily, we shall be married. So at surface level, these two weirdos in masks, written into existence 68 years apart, don't seem like they have much in common. In Eric the Opera Ghost, we get a chatty, inventive murderer who has a wide variety of obsessions, such as architectural engineering, musical composition, and emotionally vulnerable sopranos. Whereas in Michael Myers, we get a nonverbal, laser-focused artist of slaughter, a characteristic that is perhaps most famously illustrated by this scene, in which he kills a young man, then studies the corpse on the wall as though it were a Seurat or a Picasso. After this kill, a suitably suspenseful amount of time passes, and our girl Laurie gets understandably scared to death of this guy here, and here. But shouldn't an artist of slaughter be able to kill her quickly and precisely if he wanted to? Likewise, the stashing of bodies for maximum freakout factor when Laurie finds them could absolutely be the symptoms of a sicko going out of his way to psychologically mess with his victim. But why would he take his artwork off the wall the minute he put it up if he liked what he saw well enough to study it in the way he did? See, as a socially awkward crazy person who has not always been good at expressing myself to the objects of my affection, I think what we're seeing is a young man who observes a young lady with whom he badly wants to flirt, and the only language he fluently speaks is violence. Like Eric's manipulation and later destruction at the opera in the spirit of bringing his lady love into the spotlight for dragging her underground Persephone style, I believe Michael's seemingly aggressive actions toward Laurie are the closest thing he can get to, pardon the expression, a love language. And if that's the case, the slashing at Laurie's sleeve was the same to Michael as asking to hold her hand and the stashing of bodies in the cupboard were the same to Michael as getting his lady flowers or balloons. Ever hear the expression, get the gift you would want to give yourself? I think Michael has too. Also, as keen-eyed lovers of this film may recall, there's even a visual nod to Phantom in which Laurie pulls off Michael's iconic mask, mirroring an eerily similar scene in which Christine pulls off Eric's mask. A lot of the parallels I've been drawing between Phantom and Michael can be dismissed as just some movie nut's opinion with a little effort, but this one can't be 
because while it is customary to show the monster in all his gruesome glory at some point in one's creature feature, we already saw Michael's big reveal in this far more disturbing shot toward the start of the picture moments after Baby's first murder. Staging another scene in which Michael gets unmasked by Lori is the kind of thing you do when you're encouraging horror fans to make direct comparisons to that other really famous work. Therefore, if you want to take the movie's literal word that Michael and Lori are brother and sister, and that the targeting of Lori as his primary victim is motivated by... what? Jealousy? Is that what we're supposed to think drives this guy to violence? Jealousy of Lori is the favorite non-murder-prone sibling? It's fine. No, oh, seriously, it's fine. You can't be wrong if you think that Dr. Loomis told us with words that Lori and Michael are brother and sister. But if you are more inclined to believe that Michael, like the phantom before him, is a poorly socialized stranger to societal norms, who does not know how to express his feelings in a way the object of his affection can understand, I feel like the guy under the mask becomes pretty stinking relatable and maybe the tragic figure that certain other phantoms only think they are. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. I post whenever I can. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving this one a shot. Until we meet again, take it easy. Love you. Bye.